Section twenty eight, part three of Chapter seven of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone, Book one, Chapter seven, part three. Four. But as the delay of making war may sometimes be detrimental to individuals who have suffered by depredations from foreign potentates, our laws have in some respect armed the subject with powers to impel the prerogative, by directing the ministers of the crown to issue letters of mark and reprisal upon due demand, the prerogative of granting which is nearly related to, and plainly derived from, that other of making war this being indeed only an incomplete state of hostilities, and generally ending in a formal denunciation of war. These letters are grantable by the law of nations, whenever the subjects of one state are oppressed and injured by those of another, and justice is denied by that state to which the oppressor belongs. In this case letters of mark and reprisal, words in themselves synonymous and signifying a taking in return, may be obtained, in order to seize the bodies or goods of the subjects of the offending state, until satisfaction be made, wherever they happen to be found. Indeed, this custom of reprisal seems dictated by nature herself, and accordingly we find in the most ancient times very notable instances of it. But here the necessity is obvious of calling in the sovereign power, to determine when reprisals may be made, else every private sufferer would be a judge in his own cause. And, in pursuance of this principle, it is with us declared by the statute 4th Henry V, c. 7, that if any subjects of the realm are oppressed in a time of truce by any foreigners, the king will grant mark in due form, to all that feel themselves grieved. Which form is thus directed to be observed? The sufferer must first apply to the Lord Privy Seal, and he shall make out letters of request under the Privy Seal, and if, after such request of satisfaction made, the party required do not, within convenient time, make due satisfaction or restitution to the party grieved, the Lord Chancellor shall make him out letters of mark under the great seal, and by virtue of these he may attack and seize the property of the aggressor nation, without hazard of being condemned as a robber or pirate. 5. Upon exactly the same reason stands the prerogative of granting safe conducts, without which, by the law of nations, no member of one society has the right to intrude into another. And therefore Puffendorf very justly resolves that it is left in the power of all states to take such measures about the admission of strangers as they think convenient, those being over-accepted who are driven on the coast by necessity, or by any cause that deserves pity or compassion. Great tenderness is shown by our laws, not only to foreigners in distress, as will appear when we come to speak of shipwrecks, but with regard also to the admission of strangers who come spontaneously. For so long as their nation continues at peace with ours, and they themselves behave peaceably, they are under the king's protection, though liable to be sent home whenever the king sees occasion. But no subject of a nation at war with us can, by the law of nations, come into the realm, nor can travel himself upon the high seas, or send his goods and merchandise from one place to another, without danger of being seized by our subjects, unless he has letters of safe conduct, which by diverse ancient statutes must be granted under the king's great seal, and enrolled in chancery, or else are of no effect, the king being supposed the best judge of such emergencies, as may deserve exception from the general law of arms. Indeed, the law of England, as a commercial country, pays a very particular regard to foreign merchants in innumerable instances. One I cannot omit to mention is that, by Magna Carta, it is provided that all merchants, unless publicly prohibited beforehand, shall have safe conduct to depart from, come into, to tarry in, and to go through England, for the exercise of merchandise, without any reasonable imposts except in time of war, and if a war breaks out between us and their country, they shall be attached, if in England, without harm of body or goods, till the king or his chief justiciary be informed how our merchants are treated in the land with which we are at war, and, if ours be secure in that land, they shall be secure in ours. This seems to have been a common rule of equity among all the northern nations, for we learn from Stirnhook 
that it was a maxim among the Goths and Swedes, quam legem exteri nobis posura, endem illis ponemus. But it is somewhat extraordinary that it should have found a place in Magna Carta, a mere anterior treaty between the king and his natural-born subjects, which occasions the learned Montesquieu to remark with a degree of admiration that the English have made the protection of foreign merchants one of the articles of their national liberty. But indeed it well justifies another observation which he has made, that the English know better than any other people upon earth how to value at the same time these three great advantages, religion, liberty, and commerce. Very different from the genius of the Roman people, who in their manners, their constitution, and even their laws, treated commerce as a dishonorable employment, and prohibited the exercise thereof to persons of birth, or rank, or fortune, and equally different from the bigotry of the canonists, who looked upon trade as inconsistent with Christianity, and determined, at the Council of Melfi, under one Pope Urban II, A.D. 1090, that it was impossible with a safe conscience to exercise any traffic, or follow the profession of the law. These are the principal prerogatives of the king, respecting this nation's intercourse with foreign nations, in all of which he is considered as the delegate or representative of his people. But in domestic affairs he is considered in a great variety of characters, and from thence there arises an abundant number of other prerogatives. 1. First, he is a constituent part of the supreme legislative power, and, as such, has the prerogative of rejecting such provisions in Parliament as he judges improper to be passed. The expediency of which Constitution has before been evinced at large. I shall only further remark that the King is not bound by any act of Parliament, unless he be named therein by special and particular words. The most general words that can be devised, any person or persons, bodies politic or corporate, etc., affect not him in the least, if they may tend to restrain or diminish any of his rights or interests. For it would be of most mischievous consequence to the public, if the strength of the executive power were liable to be curtailed without its own express consent, by constructions and implications of the subject. Yet, where an act of Parliament is expressly made for the preservation of public rights, and the suppression of public wrongs, and does not interfere with the established rights of the Crown, it is said to be binding as well upon the king as upon the subject, and likewise the king may take the benefit of any particular act, though he be not especially named. 2. The king is considered, in the next place, as the generalissimo, or the first in military command, within the kingdom. The great end of society is to protect the weakness of individuals by the united strength of the community, and the principal use of government is to direct that united strength in the best and most effectual manner, to answer the end proposed. Monarchical government is allowed to be the fittest of any for this purpose. It follows, therefore, from the very end of its institution, that in a monarchy the military power must be trusted in the hands of the prince. In this capacity, therefore, of general, of the kingdom, the king has the sole power of raising and regulating fleets and armies. Of the manner in which they are raised and regulated, I shall speak more, when I come to consider the military state. We are now only to consider the prerogative of enlisting and of governing them, which indeed was disputed and claimed, contrary to all reason and precedent, by the long Parliament of King Charles I, but upon the restoration of his son, was solemnly declared, by the statute 13 Charles II c. 6, to be in the king alone, for that the sole supreme government and command of the militia within all his majesty's realms and dominions, and of all forces of sea and land, and of all forts and places of strength, ever was and is the undoubted right of his majesty, and his royal predecessors, kings and queens of England, and that both or either house of parliament cannot or ought to pretend to the same. This statute, it is obvious to observe, extends not only to fleets and armies, but also to forts and other places of strength within the realm, the sole prerogative as well of erecting as manning and of governing of which belongs to the king in his capacity of general of the kingdom, and all lands were formerly subject to a tax for building of castles wherever the king thought it proper. This was one of the three things, from contributing to the performance of which no lands were exempted, and therefore called by our Saxon ancestors the Trinoda Necessitus, Sic Pontus Reparatio, Arcus Constructio, and Expedio Contra Hostum. 
and this they were called upon to do so often, that as Sir Edward Coke from M. Paris assures us, there were in the time of Henry the Second one thousand one hundred and fifteen castles subsisting in England. The inconvenience of which, when granted out to private subjects, the lordly barons of these times, was severely felt by the whole kingdom. For, as William of Newbury remarks in the reign of King Stephen, errant in Anglia, quodemodo tot regis vel pontius tyranni, quot domini castellorum. But it was felt by none more sensibly than by two succeeding princes, King John and King Henry the Third. And therefore, the greatest part of them being demolished in the barons' wars, the kings of after times have been very cautious of suffering them to be rebuilt in a fortified manner, and Sir Edward Coke lays it down that no subject can build a castle, or house of strength embattled, or other fortress defensible, without the license of the king, for the danger which might ensue, if every man and his pleasure might do it. To this branch of the prerogative may be referred the power vested in his majesty, by statutes 12 Charles the Second c. 4, and 29 George the Second c. 16, of prohibiting the exportation of arms or ammunition out of this kingdom, under severe penalties, and likewise the right which the king has, whenever he sees proper, of confining his subjects to stay within the realm, or of recalling them when beyond the seas. By the common laws every man may go out of the realm, for whatever cause he pleaseth, without obtaining the king's leave, provided he is under no injunction of staying at home, which liberty was expressly declared in King John's great charter, though left out in that of Henry the Third, But, because that every man ought of right to defend the king in his realm, therefore the king at his pleasure may command them by his writ that he not go beyond the seas, or out of the realm without license, and if he do the contrary he shall be punished for disobeying the king's command. Some persons there anciently were, that by reason of their stations were under a perpetual prohibition of going abroad without license, obtained, among which were reckoned all peers, on account of their being counsellors of the crown. All knights, who were bound to defend the kingdom from invasions, all ecclesiastics, who were expressly confined, by chapter four of the Constitutions of Clarendon, on account of their attachment in the times of popery to the see of Rome, all archers and other artificers, lest they should instruct foreigners to rival us in their several trades and manufacturers. This was the law in the time of Britain, who wrote in the reign of Edward I, and Sir Edward Coke gives us many instances to this effect in the time of Edward III. In the succeeding reign the affair of travelling wore a very different aspect, an act of Parliament being made, forbidding all persons whatever to go abroad without license, except only the lords and other great men of the realm, and true and notable merchants, and the king's soldiers. But this act was repealed by the statute 4th James 1st C1, and at present everybody has, or at least assumes, the liberty of going abroad when he pleases. Yet undoubtedly if the king, by writ of Nexiat Regnum, under his great seal or privy seal, thinks proper to prohibit him from so doing, or if the king sends a writ to any man, when abroad, commanding his return, and in either case the subject disobeys, it is a high contempt of the king's prerogative, for which the offender's lands shall be seized till he return, and then he is liable to fine and imprisonment. 3. Another capacity, in which the king is considered in domestic affairs, is as the fountain of justice and general conservator of the peace of the kingdom. By the fountain of justice the law does not mean the author or original, but only the distributor. Justice is not derived from the king, as from his free gift, but he is the steward of the public, to dispense it to whom it is due. He is not the spring, but the reservoir, from whence right and equity are conducted, by a thousand channels, to every individual. The original power of judicature, by the fundamental principles of society, is lodged in the society at large, but, as it would be impracticable to render complete justice to every individual, by the people in their collective capacity, therefore every nation has committed that power to certain select magistrates, who, with more ease and expedition, can hear and determine complaints, and in England this authority has immemorially been exercised by the king or his substitutes. He therefore has alone the right of erecting courts of judicature, for, though the constitution of the kingdom hath entrusted him with the whole executive power of the laws, 
it is impossible, as well as improper, that he should personally carry into execution this great and extensive trust. It is consequently necessary that courts should be erected to assist him in executing this power, and equally necessary that if erected they should be erected by his authority. And hence it is that all jurisdictions of courts are either immediately or immediately derived from the crown, their proceedings run generally in the king's name, they pass under his seal, and are executed by his officers. It is probable, and almost certain, that in very early times, before our constitution arrived at its full perfection, our kings in person often heard and determined causes between party and party. But at present, by the long and uniform usage of many ages, our kings have delegated their whole judicial power to the judges of their several courts, which are the grand depository of the fundamental laws of the kingdom, and have gained a known and stated jurisdiction, regulated by certain established rules, which the crown itself cannot now alter but by act of Parliament. And in order to maintain both the dignity and independence of the judges in the superior courts, it is enacted by the statute 13th William the Third, C. 2, that their commissions shall be made, not, as formerly, durante bene placito, but quam diem bene segesserent, and their salaries ascertained and established, but that it may be lawful to remove them on the address of both houses of Parliament. And now, by the noble improvements of that law in the statute of 1st George the Third, C. 23, enacted at the earnest recommendation of the king himself from the throne, the judges are continued in their offices during their good behaviour, notwithstanding any demise of the crown, which was formerly held immediately to vacate their seats, and their full salaries are absolutely secured to them during the continuance of their commissions. His Majesty, having been pleased to declare that he looked upon the independence and uprightness of the judges as essential to the impartial administration of justice, as one of the best securities of the rights and liberties of his subjects, and as most conducive to the honour of the crown. In criminal proceedings, or prosecutions for offences, it would still be a higher absurdity if the king personally sat in judgment, because in regard to these he appears in another capacity, that of prosecutor. All offences are either against the king's peace, or his crown and dignity, and are so laid in every indictment. For though in their consequences they generally seem, except in the case of treason and a very few others, to be rather offences against the kingdom than the king, yet, as the public, which is an invisible body, has delegated all its power and rights, with regard to the execution of the laws, to one visible magistrate, all affronts to that power, and breaches of those rights, are immediately offences against him, to whom they are so delegated by the public." He is, therefore, the proper person to prosecute for all public offences and breaches of the peace, being the person injured in the eye of the law. And this notion was carried so far in the old Gothic constitution, wherein the king was bound by his coronation oath to conserve the peace, that in case of any forcible injury offered to the person of a fellow-subject, the offender was accused of a kind of perjury, in having violated the king's coronation oath, de sabater fregisse, juramentum regis juratum, and hence also arises another branch of the prerogative, that of pardoning offences, for it is reasonable that he only who is injured should have the power of forgiving. And therefore, in parliamentary impeachments, the king has no prerogative of pardoning, because there the commons of Great Britain are in their own names the prosecutors, and not the crown, the offence being for the most part avowedly taken to be done against the public. Of prosecutions and pardons I shall treat more at large hereafter, and only mention them here, in this cursory manner, to show the constitutional grounds of this power of the crown, and how regularly connected all the links are in this vast chain of prerogative. In this distinct and separate existence of the judicial power, in a peculiar body of men, nominated, indeed, but not removable at pleasure, by the crown, consists one main preservative of the public liberty, which cannot subsist long in any state, unless the administration of common justice be in some degree separated, both from the legislative and also from the executive power. Were it joined with the legislative, the life, liberty, and property of the subject would be in the hands of arbitrary judges, whose decisions would be then regulated only by their own opinions, and not by any fundamental principles of law, which, though legislators may depart from, 
yet judges are bound to observe. Were it joined with the executive, this union might soon be an overbalance for the legislative. For which reason, by the statute of 16th Charles I, C. 10, which established the court of Star Chamber, effectual care is taken to remove all judicial power out of the hands of the king's privy council, who, as then was evident from recent instances, might soon be inclined to pronounce, for that law, which was most agreeable to the prince or his officers. Nothing, therefore, is to be more avoided, in a free constitution, than uniting the provinces of judge and a minister of state. And, indeed, that the absolute power, claimed and exercised in a neighbouring nation, is more tolerable than that of the eastern empires, is in a great measure owing to their having vested the judicial power in their parliaments, a body separate and distinct from both the legislative and executive, and if ever that nation recovers its former liberty, it will owe it to the efforts of these assemblies. In Turkey, where everything is centred in the sultan or his ministers, despotic power is in its meridian, and wears a more dreadful aspect. A consequence of this prerogative is the legal ubiquity of a king. His majesty, in the eye of the law, is always present in all his courts, though he cannot personally distribute justice. His judges are the mirror by which the king's image is reflected. It is the regal office, and not the royal person, that is always present in court, always ready to undertake prosecutions, or pronounce judgment, for the benefit and protection of the subject. And from this ubiquity it follows that the king can never be a non-suit, for a non-suit is the desertion of the suit or action by the non-appearance of the plaintiff in court. For the same reason also, in the forms of legal proceedings, the king is not said to appear by his attorney, as other men do, for he always appears in contemplation of law in his own proper person. From the same original, of the king's being the fountain of justice, we may also deduce the prerogatives of issuing proclamations, which is vested in the king alone. These proclamations have then a binding force, when, as Sir Edward Coke observes, they are grounded upon and enforce the laws of the realm. For though the making of laws is entirely the work of a distinct part, the legislative branch, of the sovereign power, yet the manner, time, and circumstances of putting those laws in execution must frequently be left to the discretion of the executive magistrate. And therefore his constitutions or edicts concerning these points, which we call proclamations, are binding upon the subject, where they do not either contradict the old laws, or tend to establish new ones, but only enforce the execution of such laws as are already in being, in such manner as the king shall judge necessary. Thus the established law is, that the king may prohibit any of his subjects from leaving the realm, a proclamation therefore forbidding this in general for three weeks, by laying an embargo upon all shipping in time of war, will be equally binding as an act of Parliament, because founded upon a prior law. A proclamation for disarming papists is also binding, being only an execution of what the legislature has first ordained, but a proclamation for allowing arms to papists, or for disarming any Protestant subjects, will not bind, because the first would be to assume a dispensing power, the latter a legislative one, to the vesting of either of which in any single person the laws of England are absolutely strangers. Indeed, by the statute 31st Henry VIII, C. 8, it was enacted that the King's proclamation should have the force of acts of Parliament, a statute which was calculated to introduce the most despotic tyranny, and which must have proved fatal to the liberties of this kingdom, had it not been luckily repealed in the minority of his successor, about five years after. End of section 28